You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 28, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, non-IgE-mediated food allergy. Our presenter is Dr. David Stukas. He's an associate professor of pediatrics in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Okay, good morning, everyone. This is uh, COLA for August 28th, two, uh, 2020. Um, the month of August is almost gone. It's gone really quickly. Um, for our first talk this morning, uh, we have the pleasure of having Dr. David Stukas, who's an associate professor uh, in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Um, Dr. Stukas is well known in the food allergy community and has been actively involved in food allergy research and we're pleased to have him talk about a topic that we often forget about, but non-IGE mediated food allergies. Um, so I'm gonna let Dave take it away. Thank you, Dave. Oh, thank you, Paul. And thanks everybody for tuning in. I've had the pleasure of giving this talk to your group over the last couple of years, and I try to update it every time, and I have some, some new thoughts and additions to include this time as well. So we'll get right into it. If for some reason you stop seeing my screen or it's not advancing, I need somebody to yell at me, okay? Um, and so here are our objectives, and we're just going to kind of get into it. Now, I think this is an important topic because we are well-versed in the normal nuances that many infants and babies and young children experience as part of the uh, normal experience of being a human. So, you know, we know that they're going to undergo different changes in their sleep pattern, behavior, digestive issues based upon just what they eat. Um, but there may be other issues at play as well. So we know that you know, parents are going to come to us, so they'll go to their pediatricians or, or family practitioners with a common concern of what's going on with my child's poop. And parents are infatuated with poop. Um, so it's one thing that we can help address. And before we get into the meat of the talk, you know, we're really good at taking detailed histories. You know, I always say that allergists are great detectives because we know what questions to ask. We know what answers that they give will take us down different algorithms. And as we're taking our histories, we also have an understanding of what's the prevalence of these different diseases that we're worried about. Certain answers may lead us in one pathway, other answers may take us away from that. What's the differential diagnosis? And really, you know, we're seeing this more and more, but when it comes to something like this, the non-IgE mediated food allergies, a, a patient-centered approach is paramount. We need to really have a discussion, we need to listen to what their concerns are, because even if what we feel is normal, we have to explain it in a way that provides confidence to parents and, and understanding. They need to feel like we're hearing them and discussing our, our thoughts to them in a reassuring way. And it's really an individualized approach. And when it comes to stuff like this, it's completely okay to say, you know, I'm not really sure. We don't have great, you know, tests that can say yes or no what this is, but we can come up with a plan and we can revisit that in the future if things aren't going well. And one of the things that we often see, you know, we see this with food allergies, with chronic highs, with asthma, you name it. Every, you know, it's, it's normal human sort of um, instinct to say, I don't feel well, I'm noticing something in my child or myself, it must be because of what I'm eating. We all eat, you know, every day for the most part and throughout the day. So it's sort of normal human intuition. And now more than ever with, you know, online resources and there's a lot of misinformation, there are people that are really shouting at the general public saying, if you don't feel well or you have whatever symptom it may, may, may be, it's likely because of something you're eating in your diet. And that's where we can come into play to really help people understand. And when I have conversations with families, I always start with the basics. I listen, I ask them why they're here, how can I help you, what are your concerns, and I just go through some very basic definitions. It really sets the stage. And when I describe what a true allergy is with reproducible symptoms upon every exposure, oftentimes parents will say, oh, well that doesn't describe what I'm worried about at all because they can eat it in these forms. And then I describe an intolerance, which is really difficulty with digestion. We always use the, the lactose intolerance as the best example because parents who come in saying, oh, they drink lactate because they have a milk allergy, immediately we feel reassured that it's not a true allergy, but then we have to reassure parents and explain things in a way that they feel comfortable with. And then just walking through the different types of allergy. Now, a lot of times we put references at the end of talks. I'm going to put these at the beginning of the talk because these are the go-to. Um, there hasn't been much since these wonderful reviews were published. You have my slides so you can look at this on, on your own. But this is really the bulk of where I got the information from for today's conversation. 
But here's the update. You ready for this? I don't know if any of you saw this, but there's a very interesting study that was published in JAMA Pediatrics in April, I believe. And there was um, an associated editorial on, in the New England Journal of Medicine Watch, and they look at journal articles. And what these authors did was they actually went through all of the published milk allergy guidelines over the last seven years or so. And what they found was that milk allergy was listed as a cause of common symptoms, anything from rashes to colic to increased crying to poor sleep. But when you actually go through and you look at, you take an evidence-based approach to it, you know, from food challenge proven milk allergy, it's only about 1% of all infants. But if you look at some of the symptoms they describe and you look at the evidence supporting it, they're capturing one in five infants. So in other words, evidence is really lacking to support a diagnosis of milk allergy uh, when it's applied to a lot of infants out there that parents are told your child likely has a milk allergy. And the authors went to, to the next step and they actually um, surmised that when mothers who are breastfeeding are told to completely eliminate dairy from their diet, it's likely, you know, an overkill for the vast majority, if not almost all infants who have a milk allergy. Uh, it turns out when you actually do the, the challenges and you look at the evidence, very little cow's milk actually gets passed through the breast milk, especially for some of these non-allergic conditions. And then they added a little twist and they, they threw in that if you look at the guidelines, three of them were directly supported by formula manufacturers and over 80% of the authors have conflicts of interest and ties to these formula, you know, the industry. So this is new. It's really interesting. And I think what this speaks to is what we're going to talk about next. We need to take a thoughtful approach to the diagnosis that we provide. Um, it, you know, we can't just blanketly say, oh, this must be milk allergy, therefore you have to eliminate X, Y, and Z. We can't take a blanket approach and tell every single breastfeeding mother they have to stop eating these foods. We meet these mothers. We see them in tears. We see them losing weight. We see them uh, suffer through unnecessary restricted diets, and then their babies are no better. Or they undergo these restricted diets, and their babies have normal symptoms that just kind of improve over time on their own. So they say it must be because of what I eliminated or it's because of chronic diseases like eczema, which are going to wax and wane over time anyways, regardless of what you do in your diet. So I think we have a, a positive role that we can play in trying to explain this. So what are we talking about when we, when we discuss non-IgE mediated food allergy? The vast majority of these are going to involve the GI tract. We're going to spend most of our time talking about the top three. I will highlight the new um, eosinophilic esophagitis guidelines that were published in the uh, practice parameters, I should say, that were published in the spring. Um, and then we're not going to really talk about celiac disease today. We also have a couple of things we'll touch upon in regards to skin, and then I'll introduce uh, a concept surrounding Heiner syndrome and the respiratory tract, mostly because you may get asked about it on boards, not because you're going to see it in real life for the, most, for the most part. Now, when it comes to pathophysiology, it still is sort of this dark tunnel. We don't fully understand what is going on in regards to the immune system. We know that there's a role with T cells in food protein enteropathy. We know that FPIs is considered T cell mediated. Eosinophilic esophagitis is likely this mixture of IgE, non-IgE immunologic pathways, but it really is this, this you know, cloud that we don't fully understand. And what I recommend that all of us do is that we just take a consistent approach to diagnosis and management. So what are the symptoms? What are you worried about? What are the foods that you're concerned about? Does it fit in with the picture of some of these more common foods that may cause a true allergy, even if it's a late onset allergy? Is there testing available? What testing shouldn't we be doing because it can result in false positives? What's our approach to management and then also prognosis? And that's kind of how we'll go through things. This is a wonderful review um, of the international consensus guidelines for FPIs. Um, I highly recommend that, you know, especially all the fellows, um, you know, read through this and perhaps even review it together and discuss with some of your attendings. But what it really summarizes is where do we stand with our current knowledge base when it comes to FPI. So food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome, we're all familiar with this. Um, I actually love this diagnosis. I think it's great because, you know, families will go for months not knowing what's going on, thinking that their child either has multiple different food allergies or they've just been misdiagnosed. And we can spot this almost from a mile away because they're going to come in with a really good story. Oftentimes, it's going to be early in infancy, uh, you know, upon introduction of cow's milk or soy-based formula. You can have later onset, and then even adult onset FPIs has recently been described as well, although that's still poorly characterized. The most common presentation is the acute form. Um, the infant or, or, you know, or young baby will eat something, and then they're fine, and then about one to three hours later, that's when they'll have their gastrointestinal manifestation. So they can have severe repetitive vomiting, can be followed by um, severe diarrhea in the extreme cases, and then, you know, they can become very lethargic. 
uh, and almost like a shock-like you know, um, you know, picture. Um, it can be more mild as well and more subtle. The chronic presentation is really going to be more often in young infants on cow's milk or soy-based formula, and they're going to just going to have progressive, persistent symptoms like vomiting, diarrhea, failure to thrive. So it can be really hard because it can look like a lot of other conditions we're going to see as well. So we need to, you know, play our detective role and, and look for the clues. It's really hard to diagnose this after one episode. Um, I think I've done that once, and it was, you know, it was one of our nurses that we work with, and it was her daughter, it was her granddaughter, actually, and it was just a classic story for it. Um, but even then, we had the conversation of this can be multiple other things, and talking about ways to reintroduce and things like that. So you really have to have a pattern of this has happened at least twice, if not more, and rule out other, other common causes of vomiting. Um, symptoms that are lasting for longer than a few hours are less likely going to be FPIs as well. And really, if they remove the food but symptoms progress, um, you know, or they start to have more systemic manifestations, we need to really think about other diagnoses here. There, there have been criteria that have been established looking at you know, my, major or minor criteria. You, know, you can read them here. Um, the major criteria, of course, is going to be the vomiting. So if they're not vomiting, we shouldn't be thinking about FPIs. Uh, the minor criteria can include um, the lethargy, the pallor, if they've had to go to the ER, if they've had to have uh, IV fluids for, as part of their sort of treatment and resuscitation or more severe symptoms. Um, so you need to have at least the major and ideally three or more of the minor criteria to really firmly establish the diagnosis uh, because we don't have a test available, unfortunately. The most common foods that have been described include cow's milk and soy because those are the formula base um, you know, that typically cause FPIs in young infants. And then, of course, with with solid foods, it's been described with rice and wheat and oat, egg, vegetables, fruit, poultry. And the way I think about it, I mean, these are the things that we're feeding babies, right? Um, they're eating these either grains or pureed foods or oatmeal or things like that. Um, so that's what's more likely going to cause their reactions when they're younger. The majority of children only have symptoms with one food, which is really interesting because there's a new review that I'll, I'll show you soon uh, that just got published last month. And they actually qualify it as um, a significant portion of infants with FPIs react to three or more foods. But I look at it and say less than 10% react to three or more foods. So it's one of those glasses half full, glasses half empty sort of things. Um, but we know that most of them it's really one food, but we need to be aware of other foods that can cause it as well. And it's very rare in infants who are exclusively breastfed. So we need to think about other diagnoses if that's the clinical presentation. The history is the test here. Uh, we really want to just be very careful about the details that we elicit. Are there other potential causes for this, comorbid conditions? What happens when you eliminate it? Have you reintroduced it? We like to cheat as much as we can as allergies. Have you eaten it since then? If so, what's happened? Um, rarely do we need to undergo you know, endoscopies and biopsy and things like that. Uh, ATV patch tests really haven't been shown to be that helpful in these situations. Uh, and then really, you know, people have looked at food-specific IgG, IgG4 levels, but nothing's really panned out in regards to um, anything that you know offers much in, their, in regards to diagnostic accuracy. So what's missing is important. These, these babies really shouldn't be having associated urticaria, itching, swelling, other signs or symptoms of, of an IgE-mediated allergy. Oftentimes we will do IgE tests um, to rule out the IgE uh, food allergy because we don't want to miss, you know, potential for anaphylaxis and things like that. There's various reports that have followed these infants over time, some showing that they may go on to develop IgE-mediated food allergy. Whether that's actually linked to FPIs or coincidental because, you know, these kids are atopic in the first place, we don't know. Um, but it's something to kind of keep in mind uh, as you follow these infants over time. And then you can see very nonspecific abnormalities in the acute setting, such as increased white blood cell counts, thrombocytosis, so on and so forth. But that's not diagnostic for an FPIs reaction either. Now, in regards to management, we need to identify the food or suspected food and then eliminate it. Uh, we want to do everything we can not to tell people to eliminate 95 foods from their child's diet. We want to be reasonable with our management and under, you know, talk about risk. And this is where shared decision-making can really come into play. And then in regards to future reactions, we want people to be prepared and say, if we're avoiding it, they should be fine. If they do accidentally eat it, they may have a reaction again like they had before. It may progress to the point where they actually require emergency room care. I've been prescribing a lot more antiemetics to these families as well, just to have on hand because that can help lessen the severity of symptoms that may occur. And then we've all seen the standard letter. This is one example from the FPIs Foundation. We give this to all of our patients as well. I'm sure you do um, as well, which basically says, you know, this is my child's diagnosis. If they present to the ER with these symptoms, epinephrine is not going to help. 
um, you know, steroids are controversial, but oh, by the way, you're the, you're the, you know, physician treating them. If there are other things you need to think about, such as sepsis or things like that, don't let this sort of confuse you. I just want you to know that this is what my child has. In regards to feeding recommendations, this is from the, um, the great review, the international consensus. So if, if we suspect that it's cow's milk or soy, we can often try the other form. Um, and there's consideration maybe doing it in the office or it's really you know, talking to the family about their comfort level. Um, but just because you have a cow's milk induced f pies doesn't automatically mean you have to avoid soy as well. Um, and then we can try some of the solids as well as that. Um, you know, we don't always have to go straight to the hydrolyzed formulas, but they can be something to consider as well if we're running out of options. And then really we want to proceed with, you know, the different fruits and vegetables. Um, even though fruits and vegetables and grains are associated with FPIs, just because you have FPIs diagnosed to milk or soy doesn't mean you're going to develop FPIs to the other foods. And that's where a lot of confusion comes into play. So again, just being very thoughtful with that individual patient and family that you have in front of you in the office at that time is definitely not one size fits all. And we want to give them confidence moving forward. Um, and, you know, in, in, you know, sometimes concrete instructions about how to introduce it at home. Uh, this is just from the review. I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but it really goes through, if you want to look at this, uh, some, some really nice specific details. And uh, they even classify into lower risk foods or moderate risk foods or higher risk foods. Um, it's somewhat controversial what, that, what that's based upon, given the limited studies that we have and the smaller, you know, cohorts of children that are included in these, but at least it can give you a blueprint that you can follow and walk through with families. So that leads us to what's unknown. So, you know, do we need to follow strict avoidance? Do they need to read labels, such as somebody with, a, with an IgE-mediated peanut allergy? What happens if it says may contain, processed in the same facility, shared equipment? Is there a dose threshold with FPIs? We know that, you know, in you know, children with IgE-mediated peanut allergy, 95% um, of them can tolerate, you know, more than 1.5 milligrams. Um, so, you know, is that the same with FPIs? We just don't know. Can they potentially eat small amounts of it? How careful do families need to be? We know that with IgE-mediated milk and egg, you know, about two-thirds of those children can actually tolerate it when it's in the baked form. Is that the same case with FPIs? What about cross-reactivity with similar foods? What about oral food challenge in the office? Do you have to establish IV access or you can kind of, you know, use our understanding of the evidence and as children get older, their reactions should be less severe if they're going to occur at all. And then what about the role of steroids during acute reactions? It's unlikely to really, you know, to result in any benefit just based on the mechanism of action, timing of onset. But these are just things to think about because there's no right or wrong. It's not black or white. Uh, so when, as you think through this or have these conversations with families, it really is just, you know, each patient, what's their comfort level, and so on and so forth. Thankfully, um, the majority of infants with FPIs will develop tolerance with age. Um, it's an expectation for them to outgrow it. Uh, they, some can hold on to it, though, so it's just having the conversation with families of let's reevaluate in a year. As a general rule, we say let's wait about 12 months or so after your last known reaction uh, before we consider challenging again, and the only way to figure it out is to actually give it to them again. Um, I don't know what your group does, but, you know, with our, with our families, a lot of times, based upon the history, if it was very mild or if it's been a, a long period of time and the family feels comfortable with it, we'll often have them do it at home as long as they understand the risks entailed and, um, you know, everything that that, that you know, goes into because uh, it's a long day. They, it's not the normal food challenge that we go through. They have to be with us for several hours, if not the whole day, to monitor for these delayed onset reactions and then potentially treat. If you do have IV access and the ability to draw blood, should symptoms occur, um, there, are, there are some criteria that have been proposed that would say, yes, this is consistent with FPIs. Um, but that's certainly not something that we do on a consistent basis in our office. Maybe we just haven't been burned yet. Maybe we're not seeing infants that, you know, or I'm sorry, older children that have true, severe, uh, persistent FPIs. Um, but that's the approach that we've taken so far. So um, I'll move on to the next uh, Common condition that we see with non-IgE food allergy, this is food protein-induced allergic proctocolitis. So this is the really the, the last part of the GI tract that's involved. Uh, we're all familiar with this. The most common presentation is in the first six months of life, if not sooner. And infants, look they look great. They're, they're happy. They're fine. But then when parents go to change their diaper, they notice gross red blood in the stool and sometimes mucusy stools. Um, this can occur in exclusively breastfed infants as well. Uh, can, there's a range of presentations. It can be more mild. Um, they may have some colic behavior and some gassiness and things like that, but typically they're growing well and they're, they're doing really well, which is very different than like a food protein-induced enteropathy, which we'll talk about next. 
Sorry if anybody's eating breakfast at this time, but this is a, a classic picture that parents may show you from the diaper of the gross red blood. Now, the common foods, this is almost, it's not exclusively cow's milk. We can see it with soy as well, but this is typically going to be cow's milk protein. Um, it can occur in exclusively or extensively hydrolyzed formulas, but it's very rare. And then there are reports about, you know, breastfed inf infants um, that, you know, it can pass through the diet. Now, how does that work when at the beginning of this talk I said that, you know, the vast majority of infants with cow's milk allergy, their mothers can still eat their, their milk? It, it goes back to the evidence, and some of the evidence is really kind of scant when it comes to this stuff. So it goes, it really goes, just speaks to the thoughtful nature that we need to take with each patient and no blanket statements. This is not an IgE-mediated phenomenon. We don't need to do any testing at all. We don't need to do testing upon reintroduction. I still get referrals for that. It's a classic diagnosis that pediatricians should be able to make in the office, but sometimes they still send them to, to us to say, just make sure that they're not allergic before we give it again. You can't see nonspecific abnormalities. And management really, it's, you know, it's expectations. So let's manage the expectations. And we say, listen, um, we think this is the likely diagnosis. Uh, we recommend that you avoid cow's milk or soy or whatever it may be. But then let families know that this can take a few days before it completely resolves. Because there are too many infants out there that nothing's better 12 to 24 hours later, and then they get changed to another formula. Or they get changed to an extensively hydrolyzed formula. So we really want to avoid playing the formula roulette and manage our expectations. And we can do that because this is a relatively benign condition. Parents get very worried when they see bright red blood in their, in their baby's diaper. But we know that if this is the diagnosis, it's okay. We have time to figure this out. We're not going to cause long-term damage if we don't pick the right formula or make the right switch right away. Um, but we can cause more damage by you know, having families think that their child is allergic to multiple different foods uh, and going straight to you know, extensively hydrolyzed formulas, which have increased cost, uh, they don't, they're not as palatable, and so on and so forth. Um, and then the prognosis, this magically goes away. We don't necessarily have to wait until 12 months. Often we will because that's when we recommend that you know, babies can start drinking milk and things like that because of the anemia associated with it. Um, but you, know, you can actually try to introduce dairy sooner than 12 months. Um, spontaneous resolution is the norm, and we can just give it again without any testing. So really this, this diagnosis here is all about confidence on our part and the part of the pediatrician, and then instilling confidence in the parents as well as they navigate this and try to reintroduce it. And then the last really sort of big non-IgE um, food allergy affecting the gastrointestinal tract would be food protein-induced enteropathy. Now this one should grab our attention. These infants are typically pretty sick. Um, it's going to happen almost always early in the first nine months of life or so. Tons of diarrhea, often will have failure to thrive, uh, can have abdominal distension, malabsorption. Um, oftentimes we're going to get consulted on these babies in the inpatient setting, uh, typically on the GI service. Uh, the most common food would be cow's milk when it comes to this, but you can see it with other foods as well. Um, it's real rare and extensively breastfed infants. So that milk protein induced allergic proctocolitis really stands out as the one that potentially can get transmitted through the breast milk, whereas the other ones really shouldn't. This is not IgE mediated, so IgE testing will be negative. Um, biopsy can provide some confirmation by looking at different histology um, and seeing increased intraepithelial leukocytes. And then you just have the nonspecific abnormalities. I mean, these kids are sick. They're not absorbing the food that they're eating. And whatever they're eating is causing ongoing damage to their gut as well. Um, so they're not going to look very well. Elimination diets can help. It's going to take time for this to resolve. So if we think about, you know, the severity of this condition, the body needs time to heal. So we need to manage expectations accordingly. Uh, and then these families are going to need a lot of nutritional monitoring and support. The good news is um, this tends to get better as kids get older. It magically disappears for reasons we don't fully understand. Almost always by a year of age, if not by two years of age. Um, so we want to counsel families that this isn't a lifelong you know, allergy or condition. And by the way, we also want to counsel families that these non-IgE mediated food allergies, if we, that's the diagnosis, they're very different than anaphylaxis and risk of having, you know, um, a reaction, you know, from, you know, cross contact and things along those lines. So that's something else we have to clarify with families as well. This is the, the new article that I just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. Um, I think it's really good. Um, it, it, it really reinforces a lot of what the other two articles I mentioned before go into. Talks a little bit more about some of the adult FPIs that still remain poorly characterized, but I like this diagram because it shows you these are the parts of the GI tract that are involved with the various conditions. Uh, so it just kind of, you know, puts things in a, in, a, in a visual context for those who like to learn that way. 
Uh, when we talk about the differential diagnosis, it is extensive, uh, so we always want to consider other conditions as well before we diagnose a non-IgE food allergy, considering that we don't have a diagnostic test that says, yes, you have non-IgE food allergy or no, you don't. Um, so this is just these are some things to consider, and uh, the questions that we need to ask or testing we need to pursue will vary based upon those. Now, when it comes to eosinophilic GI disease, the most common form will be eosinophilic esophagitis, and that's what I'm going to focus on for the purpose of this talk, but that's a whole separate sort of condition that you know, we need to know about and be aware of. Um, we are seeing it more and more for reasons we don't fully understand. It tends to be more male predominant, um, especially early on, and there is a genetic component behind this as well. We know that these individuals are atopic. This is a great review in the New England Journal of Medicine um, that really walks through just the the multifactorial etiology of these eosinophilic diseases and eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, some people say it is, you know, a food allergy. Other people say it's a food allergy-esque disease. Um, but as you all know, it's really, you know, inflammation inside the esophagus that is often related to ingestion of specific foods, uh, but, it, but also very different than IgE. Now, the presentation can vary. It can be very mild. It can be chronic. It can be severe. It can wax and wane over time. In younger children, it tends to be more abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, failure to thrive. Adults tend to have more of um, GERD-like symptoms or they may have solid food impaction and dysphagia, uh, so it can progress over time. Whether they've had EOE for years and years and years, it just went unrecognized, and then they have their impaction, or whether this you know, presents like that, it, it varies by individual. Milk. This one tends to be, you know, cow's milk is associated with um, a lot of these patients, at least half of them. Uh, it's also been associated with other foods as well, including wheat uh, and egg, but you know, other foods have been implicated in this, and we'll talk about testing in a second. Now, the international guidelines were updated about two years ago. I think it was two summers ago. Um, and this is where they really came up with um, new diagnostic criteria that recognizes the heterogeneous nature of eosinophilic esophagitis. So I think we're at the point where we can definitely phenotype this more. It's definitely not one size fits all like it was you know, 10, 15 years ago when we first started recognizing this. So you have to have symptoms. Um, it's really hard to establish a diagnosis of EOE in patients who are asymptomatic. There are other reasons why eosinophils can be in the esophagus. Um, in my Former position about a decade ago, the ear, nose, and throat docs, every time they took out tonsils, for some reason, they were biopsying the esophagus. I don't know why. And they were sending us all these kids that had, you know, 10 EOs or, or 20 EOs or things like that, and we had no idea what to do with them. So we don't want to be doing that. Um, it's generally agreed upon that you have to have at least 15 eosinophils per high-powered field. Um, and, you know, this should be isolated the esophagus. Otherwise, if you have eosinophilic inflammation throughout the rest of the GI tract, we're talking about other forms of either EGID or other inflammatory conditions that can cause that. Um, and then I talked about the heterogeneity. So when we do the endoscopies, there's a whole variety of findings that you may see. Um, you know, the, you can have rings, you can have furrows, exudates, edema. It depends on just the severity of, of and you know, duration of how long it's been there. But a normal esophagus doesn't rule it out. You still have to do the biopsy. And when you do the biopsies, ideally, we would have multiple biopsies taken from, you know, all three segments of the esophagus if you can. We obviously want to go where there's apparent inflammation and see what that looks like. Um, we do recommend going a little bit lower just to rule out, you know, eosinophilic disease of the, of the uh, rest of the GI tract. Uh, and just because you have EOS doesn't mean you have eosinophilic esophagitis. Here are some of the conditions of which you may have eosinophils in the esophagus. Um, as we sort of talked about, you know, don't, don't forget about uh, rheumatologic conditions and connective tissue disorders or inflammatory bowel disease. Um, you know, common things present in uncommon ways sometimes, so we need, to think, we need to keep those things in mind as well. Now, in regards to management, this really is um, the paradigm of what we do best as allergists. When we're talking about shared decision-making, with eosinophilic esophagitis, this is where we should be at our finest. Uh, we need to talk to families or talk to patients about here are what our options are. Um, it's not black or white. We don't have head-to-head -head studies, and I'll go through the practice parameters in a second. There's nothing that says you have to do it this way, you have to do it this way. It really is talking about here are the different treatments, here's what the treatment entails, here are the potential side effects, and even dietary avoidance. We have to talk about the side effects of dietary avoidance. Um, and then here are the expected outcomes. Uh, so, you know, this is a great opportunity to have that conversation with families and, and with patients, I should say. 
Now, the medical treatment, it re nothing's really changed a whole lot. We do, you know, want, want to consider um, use of a proton pump inhibitor because a lot of patients will just symptomatically improve by using the PPI for a period of time. Um, we also, you know, we have the, the inhaled steroids that we swallow. Uh, not an all whole lot has changed in regards to that in recent years. Now, when it comes to dietary therapy, you know, it's, it's been interesting to sort of watch the evidence evolve in regards to this. Uh, it used to be skin test everybody because that's the only tool that we have and uh, we don't really know what's going on. It turns out that that may not actually be a very useful way to guide elimination and we get a lot of false positives because there's a lot of atopic individuals who end up developing eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, but, you know, I, the approach that I recommend is that you have the conversation with families and say, listen, we don't have a great way that says, yes, these are the foods or food that you need to avoid and that this is what to expect. So we just have that honest conversation and we say, this is what's been tried, this is what hasn't been tried. When we think about eliminating it, why are we eliminating the food? How are we going to do it? And for what duration? Um, so some, fam some, some people may not want this. They may say, you know what? I don't want to live my life if I can't eat six foods. Um, this, I love to eat. And we can say, well, let's try a medical therapy first and see how you respond and so on and so forth. Um, there's been some more research looking at just, you know, what if we just went straight elemental diet? Well, it turns out if you stop eating food, almost everybody gets better. Um, but that's a really hard way to live. So <laughs> it's not a, not a great option for a lot of folks. If you look at six food elimination, four food elimination, two food elimination, or just taking out dairy, um, you can make headway. So it depends. Do you want to, it depends on the severity of the presentation. If we have a, a child who has very mild symptoms, um, but, you know, they meet criteria for the diagnosis of the EOE, I'm hard pressed to say you need to take six foods out of your diet. Um, I have the conversation with families. Here are our options. There's always options. Um, so really just thinking through what families prefer, um, what is of value to them, uh, and then helping them sort of decide along the way what they want to do. Now, in regards to prognosis, this also is highly variable. It depends upon how old they were when they presented, how severe they were, what are their endoscopy findings. Uh, we do recommend long-term monitoring for all patients because this can take on a waxing, waning sort of clinical course. It can get worse over time. We don't have the right answer. Are we going to treat until we have histologic improvement and, and make people undergo endoscopies in a repeated fashion every, what, two, three, four, six months? Are we going to treat until symptoms improve and then do endoscopies as sort of more of monitoring? Who stays on maintenance therapy? Uh, we know that you can have chronic remodeling similar to asthma, which makes sense because if you have ongoing inflammation and swelling, uh, you can develop strictures over time. You can have food impactions that, you know, increase your risk to have future food impactions. Uh, so these are things that just need to be thoughtfully uh, discussed with every single patient. So here we have the new practice parameters. This was a joint effort with the um, practice parameters on allergy and immunology and with the American um, Gastroenterological Association. And these were published finally this year. Now, these actually use the new grading system. I don't it's not necessarily new, but it's just different from the traditional practice parameters. And what grade does is it, it really develops specific questions. And then you undergo a systematic review uh, for each question to see if you can find relevant data. So this isn't an overall comprehensive, this is EOE. There's always background and things like that. But these are really, what are the specific questions that we're trying to answer? And then we go through the, the review of the evidence, um, and then we um, do a technical report, and then basically write out the clinical guidelines so that people can hopefully understand it. And what this turns out doing is that we give, we give strength to our recommendations and strength to the evidence. So you're going to see this. I'll, I'll put this out for the, the first seven questions that were asked for this practice parameter. For a strong recommendation, it means different things for the patient and clinician. A strong recommendation for the patient means most people are going to want to do this. A strong recommendation for the clinician means most people should probably think about this, you know, this interaction. Uh, and because it's going to probably help most people when we think about it, but not everybody. So the one thing I want to say, and hopefully for those who are either browsing the internet or, or whatnot, if you can pay attention for one second, when it comes to practice parameters or clinical guidelines, there are no guideline police. You're not going to get handcuffed if you don't follow the guideline to the letter of the law. These are guidelines. There is no blueprint for it that will cover every single nuance in every scenario that you're going to see with your patient that's in front of you. So use the guidelines accordingly and use them as a blueprint to say, these are things I should be thinking about. And then more importantly, do these guidelines actually apply to the patient who's in front of me right now? Um, I'll get off my soapbox now. 
So, and when it comes to conditional recommendation, uh, as you'll see as we go through it, so the majority of people would say, yeah, that sounds pretty good, but many would not. So conditional, say, yeah, that's not for me, dietary elimination. You know, a lot of people may say that's great. For me, I'm okay with not doing that. And then for the clinician, it's really, you know, different choices will be appropriate for different patients. So we should not be telling patients what they should be doing. We should be actually discussing with them what the evidence shows, what the options are, what the expected outcomes are, and helping them make a decision according to their own individual care. Now, when it comes to the um, certainty of evidence, high degree, we're very confident that the true effect lies close to the estimate. So the evidence looks really good, very low, we have very little confidence. Um, so hopefully you kind of keep that in mind as we go through these. So when it comes to the EOE practice parameters, the first recommendation in patients with symptomatic eso esophageal eosinophilia suggest using proton pump therapy over no treatment. So you see it's not proton, it's not PPI versus dietary elimination because there are no studies really. It's PPI versus doing nothing. There's a conditional strength of recommendation. Most people would want to do this, uh, but it's not for everybody. But the evidence is very low quality. So that's what we're dealing with here. We're just evaluating the existing evidence to try to make these recommendations, and hopefully that makes sense. So most people would opt for this. It makes sense. Very, you know, not as much risk as with some other things potentially, but there are risks to consider. Number two, in patients with eosinophilic esophagitis, we recommend topical glucocorticosteroids over no treatment. So the strength is strong because this tends to work pretty darn well for most people, uh, but it doesn't mean you have to do it for everybody. And there's actually moderate, you know, evidence that would support this. And, you know, we know that. It's a mainstay of treatment. That's sort of, you know, how we treat EOE, and we have for the last decade or so. And then the next question is, we recommend topical glucocorticosteroids over oral. So, you know, we can treat anybody with prednisone or systemic glucocorticosteroids, but then you're going to, you know, cross over to unfavorable side effects. So this is more of a conditional, um, and then the quality of evidence is more moderate. Well, I'll just go through a couple more here. In patients with EOE, we suggest elemental diet over no treatment. This isn't elemental versus, you know, four food or versus two food. But look at the comment. Patients who put a higher value on avoiding the challenges of adherence to an elemental diet and prolonged process of dietary reintroduction may reasonably decline this treatment option. And, you know, on the allergy side, we fought really hard to include this because we wanted, you know, our, our wonderful colleagues to understand on the GI side that this isn't for everybody. This is really hard for a lot of people to do for an elemental diet. And you look at the strength of the recommendations, conditional. So most people may say this is, you know, for me, but not everybody. And the evidence is pretty good evidence that says this works. Next one would be patients with EOE. We suggest using an empiric six-food elimination over no treatment. So what if we just talk, you know, take out the top six allergens? And again, and again, it has the same comments. This has a conditional strength of recommendation, and this has very low quality of evidence. There's just not that many studies that have done this. Next approach, in patients with EOE, the, um, the group suggests using an allergy testing-based elimination diet over no treatment. So if you look at this, the strength of the recommendation, again, is conditional. A lot of people would say this, this is the way to go, but the quality of evidence is very low quality. So if you're going to go dietary elimination, um, according to the practice parameters, you're better off going elemental diet or the six-food elimination rather than doing a bunch of skin prick tests trying to use that to find, you know, the specific foods that may be causing it. Not saying don't do it, just saying if you're going to do this, understand there's not much evidence to support that approach when it comes to EOE. And then this last one deals with discontinuation of therapy. So a patient who's in remission after short-term use of glucocorticosteroids the parameter suggests continuation of topical glucocorticosteroids over discontinuation. And this has a conditional strength of recommendation and very low quality of evidence. So we put this in, and as you can see, it's basically saying, well, what do we do with these patients that really suffered, um, you know, they got better. Do we stop their therapy? Do we continue the therapy? There's a lot of wiggle room when it comes to this. And you can see the comments on that as well. So hopefully that gives you a sense of at least some, some of the questions that were asked. Um, the approach to trying to answer those questions. And ultimately what it comes down to is this is, again, as I mentioned before, the perfect approach for using shared decision making. So you have the conversation, PPI, steroids, diet. You walk through specific choices. It's more like what does this actually look like? How long are we going to do it for? And then you reassess. Because if they're not improved, you want to consider additional options. If they are improved, then you have the conversation about how long do you actually do this for. So that kind of wraps up our GI portion. We'll go through the next the next um, few in uh, just a few minutes here as we wrap up, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. 
So with contact dermatitis, we know that there's a lot of foods that can cause direct irritation rash through contact. The idea of systemic dermatitis through ingestion uh, has been reported. It is somewhat controversial, but it's out there and something to think about. Uh, when it comes to you know skin contact, um, basically it's just you know direct exposure can cause the irritation, whether it's through a, a T cell mediated mechanism or whether it's more of a non-specific irritant effect. Uh, we see this all the time, especially in infants who have sensitive skin or eczema or dermatic graphism. Various foods touch their skin and cause a rash. These are the things to think about. Is it more contact or to carry? Is it allergic? Is it irritant? Um, you know, what's our actual diagnosis? This is a, a nice review I put in here that looked at some different examples of foods. Um, so if you look at the top left, we have mango dermatitis, which is kind of interesting around the mouth here. This is somebody who was peeling garlic and they had uh, peeling of their skin on their hands. Uh, this is a baker, I believe, uh, who had to contact dermatitis from wheat, uh, just from using flour with their hands. Uh, so this can occur and it's something to be aware of. Patch testing is generally the way to go. This is not an IgE-mediated phenomenon. You might be able to identify um, you know, by using patch tests. And then management is just avoidance. Um, you know, if you suspect systemic reactions, we really want to go complete dietary avoidance for a month or two. Uh, if symptoms don't improve, you, that's probably not your diagnosis. There must be something else going on. If symptoms do improve, it's always going to be, well, what happens when you eat it again? Um, and you always have to consider comorbid conditions. When we think about the most common foods associated with systemic, we're really talking about balsam of Peru, which is often used in fragrances. You can find it in all kinds of different foods, um, such as citrus fruits and tomatoes and chocolate. And then nickel, I'm sure you've heard about as well. And nickel is interesting because um, there's a lot of foods that grow in the ground that can uh, have nickel contamination from the soil or if they're stored in cans. Um, so this can be really difficult to avoid if you suspect that that's what's going on. So we want to be very careful about who we say, oh, you need to take all nickel out of your diet. And there's actually like nickel ladders that have been um, published where, you know, this, this type of exposure would have smaller amounts of nickel compared to this type of exposure and so on and so forth. So just more to be aware of. And then the last one is one of my favorites. Um, so we've all seen patients that have concerns about toxic mold and stachybotrys and black mold syndrome. And there's the Mold Treatment Centers of America located that will take $40,000 from you and they'll do their complicated testing and their intense detoxification system to reduce your exposure to black mold. And you always say, where the heck is this coming from? Well, it actually, I think a lot of it started um, in the last couple of decades. Uh, and, and initially there was a group of infants in Cleveland where I did my allergy training um, that had bleeding in their lungs. And the one thing that a lot of the families reported was in the, the environment where they lived, oftentimes it was inner city housing, things like that, there was black mold everywhere. So the initial thought was, oh, exposure to black mold must be causing these babies to have bleeding in their lungs. And that's what got reported widely. As you see, New York Times ran this in 1997. Well, lo and behold, a few years later, uh, you know, an update was out and it basically said, um, you know, there is no evidence to support this. So even though it went wild, wild in the media for a couple of years, it turns out the evidence doesn't actually support that, that correlation that was going on. And what they were talking about was pulmonary hemosiderosis, otherwise known as Heiner syndrome. So this is very rare. It's, um, it's, we're going to think about young children. Uh, oftentimes, they were started on cow's milk formula and chronic respiratory symptoms, pulmonary infiltrates, and then oftentimes, we'll have high titers of precipitating it. Um, I should be antibodies to cow's milk, sorry for that. And then you take milk out of their diet and they get better. Um, it's a very unusual phenomenon. This is not something I would expect that you're going to see clinically. Um, I've certainly never seen this, but it's something that you may be asked about on your board exams. So as we wrap up here, you know, I love this. This is from that review I mentioned that was just published in July. I put the, the um, link on there as well. This really is a multidisciplinary approach. So it starts with the primary care physician. Uh, oftentimes we'll get referred to either us or to gastroenterology. We need to do our absolute best to establish the diagnosis. Uh, is really tricky as we as we spent you know the last 45 minutes talking about because we don't have a great test that says yes this is f pies yes this is food protein induced enteropathy things like that we want to involve the family in making our decisions we often will need to involve nutritionists to help guide dietary avoidance and suitable options that they can use uh, we have to have a nice relationship with our pathologists if, if there's going to be biopsies done for you know children at risk to go to the emergency room we talk about the letter for f pies so really for these patients. Um, I, I'd like for you to think about just this multidisciplinary approach. I think that's a good way to go. And this goes back to that, that new link I put about that JAMA Pediatrics report. Um, and I like this comment. So this is the comment in the New England Journal of Medicine, Journal Watch, about how cow's milk allergy has been overdiagnosed. Um, and you can read it yourself, but you know, basically 
a lot of times cow's milk is blamed for rashes and colic and just normal infant behavior. And it, it, it's overdiagnosed. Um, and I think we should all reconsider before we tell every single breastfeeding mother that she needs to avoid milk. Because uh, I think that's going to cause a lot more harm than it is good in the long run and on a population level. So in summary, um, you know, there's, these are things to be aware of. Uh, we need to focus on our history and understanding of what these conditions do. And with that, I'm more than happy to take any questions. And I can stop sharing my screen if you like. But thank you all very much for, for joining me today. Oh, hi, Dave. It's Jody Shroba. Um, thank you for the Jody. great presentation. Um, question for you, because this is slightly off topic, but kind of not really. Um, since you're big on the social media front, have you had any successful tips on how to get people to stop doing food panels for eczema in these babies? Oh, uh, boy. Um, I have worked long and hard for the last five to eight years of running the circuit. I give grand rounds everywhere as, as much as I possibly can. Um, we, I, uh, th I should have retired after this. We got our lab at Nationwide Children's to remove food allergy panels from our laboratory. We serve as the main lab for all of Central and Southeastern Ohio. We just took it off the menu. People can still order food-specific IgEs, but they have to be talked about which ones they do. So that was part of the approach as well. Um, it's when I write letters back to referring providers, I actually include a blurb about why these are dangerous. I talk to every family about um, the, the harm that comes from these. Uh, so it, it really is just repetitive effort on every level that you can possibly imagine. Um, yeah, <laughs> I wish I had the easy answer for you, but it takes, a, it takes a, lot of, a lot of effort to try to reverse this. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks, Dave. We appreciate you taking the time from your busy schedule to speak with us this morning. And have a great weekend and keep safe. Yes, thank you all. Um, I hope to see you all in person very soon. Thanks.